Hey, this is John. Thanks for joining me for this first part in a build series of the MS-14S Gelgoog Master Grade Kit from Bandai. The, the Gelgoog is, um, I, I love the look of this, this mobile suit. It's a, it's a big beefy mobile suit. Um, it's got those great Xeon bell bottoms. Uh, just a, a big, you know, I mean, it looks like it's a lineman on a football team. I really like the look of this. And I deliberately picked this version because it's in uh, charged, charged colors, the, the pink and the red. I, I kind of like those colors. So I'll be doing the canon look for this, although I may add a little bit of variation to some of the colors just to break up uh, some of the space. Now, I've already gotten the kit nipped and denubbed. I've got all the parts removed from the runners and I actually put it together um, so I could kind of see where seam lines are, how it's going to look, kind of help me understand how I want to do the approach to the build. But I'm going to disassemble it and uh, get that ready for uh, further painting and detailing. Now you can see I've got him assembled here um, and and he's 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 a it's a big mobile suit. Um, he doesn't quite fit on on camera, and if I pull back too much further, you'll start seeing the rest of my desk. Um, so uh, he doesn't fit uh, totally on screen unless I get him twisted around like this. Now, when I was building the, the model, when I was cleaning up the nubs, building the model, I made sure that all of the the pegs that connect the parts together, that I nipped them off a little bit. Um, so that it would make disassembly easier. If you've ever built a Bandai model, you know that sometimes when you put two parts together, the, uh, the trying to get them back apart can often be very, very difficult. And if you have to resort to a sharp blade or something like that to try and start separating them, you can gouge into the parts, create loads of problems. Um, so what I do generally, if I'm going to be pre-assembling it and then taking apart, I'll either, the, the peg, I'll clip at an angle so that it's only about half of its length. Or if it's, it's not possible to clip the peg or if the peg is a hollow peg, uh, and if you've built one of these, you'll know what I'm talking about. If the peg is a hollow peg, then the hole that the peg goes in, I'll put a slice in, in the, I guess you'd say the female end of the join so that it's not quite as uh, grippy um, when, when you put the two together. But that way I can take it apart, but it helps me to see, like for instance, you know, it helps me to see if I build it first, here's this, here's this panel line here. Now, it's done in such a way that it's supposed to look like a seam line, but I'm going to want to take some extra steps to further sell that notion. So I'll be showing how I do that um, to prepare the parts. Um, other places you may find, oh, there goes the top of his head. I'll just go ahead and we'll call that disassembled. Um, other places that there's a seam you may want to uh, glue together. Um, and so you'll need to know ahead of time, you know, how, how can I glue, where, where am I going to glue this together? Like right here, I may make that into a seam line. I may glue it together. I haven't decided yet, but it just lets you, kind of prepare ahead of time and see what you want to do to handle the various um, seam lines and panel lines across the, the model. Thankfully this one doesn't have um, really any major seam lines that either would be a problem to seal up or just to convert into a panel line so it's it's fairly good in that regard but I'm really I'm really looking forward to weathering this guy um, because he's got a load of surface to weather. So there's going to be the ability to apply a lot of techniques um, to him to really give a, what I hope will be an interesting surface. And also the interior frame on this one is just so nice, so full of detail. So I'll be doing a lot of painting. Most of it won't be seen, but sometimes doing it just for fun, I think is good enough. Um, because, you know, that's what we're doing this hobby for is fun. So uh, even if it won't be seen, I think taking the time to paint some of the details that Bandai builds into Gunpla um, can really just extend the enjoyment of the kit. Now, I don't know if this series is going to go 
three episodes or six episodes or whatever. I don't want to extend it unnaturally. But my plan is not to do it on a technique-based per episode kind of cycle, but rather just work for a while and see where I end up. I'm going to target making the videos, eh, you know, anywhere from 25 minutes to 45 minutes. It just depends on how, uh, how much I'm getting done and what I want to focus on for that, uh, for that build and where I'm at in, in a certain point in the model. So um, it's going to go on for a little while, um, but I hope you'll find it uh, informative and useful and fun. Um, and I hope I do too. <laughs> um, I'd hate to start in on a model and then halfway through hate it and realize ah, I'm never going to finish this video. So um, I'm, I'm certainly planning on finishing this one. And, uh, uh, but I think this is going to be a great kit to build and it's got a, um, an interesting look to it. And I hope you'll continue following along. All right, I'm going to get to disassembling. Okay, as I go through disassembly, one of the things that I do is I look on each major component for areas that I want to enhance the panel line just a little bit, or the seam lines. This is one of them. You'll notice that where these two parts join, like that, there's, um, it's intended to be a panel line. But when I glue this together, um, it's going to tighten up a little bit and a little bit of a, a, a glue bead may come up there. I won't push it together too tight, but I do, when I'm doing the final assembly on these, I do glue them, um, at least on those parts. Because when you're, when you're clipping the pegs, you, you, it makes it the disassembly easy, but it also means it can fall apart easy if you're not careful, so I will glue that. But what I do, um, and it, early on, when I'm taking it apart like this, is whenever I find a seam line like that, I grab my Tamiya scriber, and you can use any scribing tool. This is just my favorite. But what I'll do is I'll just hold the parts together like that and just scribe in some additional depth like that. Not a lot, but I start that process now, later on, I may go back in when the parts are disassembled and do some additional sanding and filing to make that more prominent. Um, and in some areas, I plan to use other tools to, to, make, to give different effects um, to it, to, to make it wider, to, to do some chiseling, things like that. Um, but this is a perfect stage to, to go in and just use your scriber and just kind of deepen those panel lines and enhance where they're at. Um, and I recommend doing it without a camera right in your face so you can actually see what you're doing. Um, but I, as I'm disassembling each, each part, I go through and do that so that it starts it and I can look at the part later and tell, okay, I meant to enhance that panel line there. So this is a handy tool to have. Um, a dedicated scribing tool is handy to have um, so if you don't have one, I'd recommend picking one up. It will make your life a lot easier. So I'll continue doing this and get all the parts disassembled. Another thing that I think is worth noting, when I am disassembling it, I only disassemble the parts down as far as I need to without creating additional problems with painting. By that, I mean I'll leave this, this arm frame together. Um, I'll prime it like this. I'll paint it like this. I'll do all the, the weathering and additional you know, touches to it. When I'm priming it, I'll prime it open like that and then I'll fully bend it and hit it with primer again and then leave it 24 hours uh, to dry and then I can put it back into position and do the painting. The reason I, I paint it assembled like this is one, a lot of it's not going to be seen, so it just, it's just a little bit of a time saver. Um, but, but two, for the inner frame, because I'm going to be doing a lot of dry brushing and things like that, um, it works better, in my opinion, to do the painting and, and uh, weathering on the inner frame all together because you want it to look as one whole. For me, the, the panels on the outside, if there's some variation, I think that just looks natural. Um, but 
you know, for example, if these, these two parts don't, but if these two parts had pegs, I would go ahead and clip them back together and uh, prime them and paint them together like that and then only later disassemble them, put them back together. So when you're, when you're working on it, do it however you want, of course, but I like to, to say, okay, I'm going to keep the breakdown of parts to the minimum needed to fully paint and get it ready for assembly and later weathering and detailing steps. So um, that's, that's kind of the strategy I take in, in uh, pulling this guy apart. I'm in the middle of pulling everything apart and getting it into my little plastic box with the, with the uh, various compartments so that I can have my arms over here, you know, the legs over there. But I wanted to point out one of the things I'm really looking forward to. Underneath the skirting, underneath the armor, there is loads of detail. Look at those parts um, for the frames, for these, for these rockets. Um, the, that's just the waste unit. Um, that is going to be so much fun to paint and detail and all of that. The, the rear skirting has this framework. These, these older master grade kits, um, I loved the extra detail that Bandai put into them. I don't know why. Newer ones don't always have this. Um, some of the newer ones I built just, just didn't have this level of impressive detail. So that's one of the great things uh, about this kit is it's, it's just loaded with detail like that. When you, when you take a look, for example, under here, you, you won't see any of, any of this when it's done up under here, but you'll see when I fully disassemble it and get to it, there is just a ton of detail up under there. So I know I'm, I'm not saying a whole lot other than just being excited about it, but I mean, this is one of the things that I think makes this kit really awesome is just the sheer level of detail that it gives you. Um, it's, it's an older kit. It's, it's, uh, it's affordable, but man, it's just loaded with fun. So I'm really, really excited about this. Have I mentioned that? <laughs> all right. I've got all the parts sorted into trays. Um, I use these craft box trays, of course like I'd already shown. Um, I generally keep it right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg, but this guy's so big, it's right leg, right leg, left leg, left leg. <laughs> and I've got the torso here, the head and the weapon here, and then pretty much everything else is stuck over here. So there's a, there's a lot going on here, but he's broken down and I've got him at the point that I want for painting. All right, my, my plan for the inner frame is to do something a little different than the standard gray um, that the parts come cast in. I want it to be, I'm gonna prime it in black, then I'm gonna dry brush it with a silver color. I'm probably gonna use Citadel's Lead Belcher for the dry brushing because I want it to have a steely, um, really you know heavy metal, grungy look to it. Then once the, the dry brushing is done, I'll apply um, some shades, some washes, that kind of thing. And then I'll go back and pick out individual details with various colors and then, you know, weather those so that it looks like the rest of the frame. But I've got to get that, that silver uh, done first. Now, I'm going to do it in, in one of several ways. Some parts, like the frame or the, the inner leg frame here, I can just paint that as one part, I can prime it, uh, do the dry brushing, get that done all as one part like this. Um, I may pop this off just to make it a little easier, but that'll, you know, just be done just in and of itself as a, as a single part. Some parts that are uh, going to be inner frame are attached to outer frame armor parts. So like this part, there's a gray part here that other things connect to. I'll leave this gray part in here um, and just prime it because I can get all of the, the spaces that can be seen uh, with the primer and then dry brush the external parts. Very little of this is actually going to be seen, so I can, I can work this one that way um, and it'll do just fine. This part goes on the outside 
in order to dry brush it, I'm going to have it popped off, paint it black, dry brush it, and it'll give it a nice look. And then when I pop them back together, it essentially masks off the inside so I can paint the outside without having to worry about getting any paint on the inner parts. Other parts like this waist armor, I'll just leave it as it is, uh, prime it with the, uh, the black, dry brush it. Then when I need to paint the external armor, all I'll do is mask off just that one little peg right there, or this, this connector right there, and give that the outer color and it'll be good to go. The shoulder piece um, here, I could pop this out, he says as he can't pop it out. Anyway, this, this part and this part can come out. But again, they won't be seen, um, uh, that you won't be able to see much of it. So I'm just gonna leave it in there and prime it black and dry brush it on the inside. But this way, everything that's internal armor uh, or that's the, the inside of all the armor pieces are gonna be black and silver. So when you look at it, you won't see any plastic or any of the external color showing up. The reason I wanna do that is that setting up the plan for chipping for later on down the road because it'll set the precedent that the basic color is a black steely kind of color. So when I later, once the external paint is on and I'm getting to weathering and I'm chipping it, the, the chipping will be consistent with the internal uh, color. So it'll, it'll look hopefully organic. Um, and if nothing else, doing it this way is just a lot more fun. Um, I've done a few frames like this on master grade kits that have some detail and it's just a lot of fun. So um, if nothing else, I plan to enjoy it because that's what it's all about really when you get down to it. So I'm gonna take these parts uh, uh, back over to my airbrush station. Airbrush station, I went, I went to Sean Connery mode there, airbrush station. I'm gonna take them over to my airbrush station and uh, get them primed up and I'll show you what that looks like and then start the dry brushing. All right, I have the interior and frame parts primed. I used Badger Steinal Res Primer for this. Um, it produces a really nice, smooth satin finish. Uh, it looks pretty cool. I've always thought it'd be kind of nice to do uh, a model entirely in that black primer. It just looks so nice. Um, I did end up pulling these parts out of here um, just to make it a little easier to get to. One of the things about priming uh, a Bandai model, Bandai plastic especially, that I need to mention, the, the way Bandai manufactures their plastic so that it fits so well is they don't do a final step at the end of what most model makers do, which is a process called baking, um, which essentially takes the, the sprues out when they come out of the mold and puts them through, I've heard it's, both, it's either a physical or a chemical process, but for the sake of what we're talking about, it doesn't matter. But that process hardens the plastic. You, you know, Bandai plastic is always a little bit, a little bit soft. Baking causes a little bit of shrinkage for any model. Now, good manufacturers take advantage of, you know, the maths and they figure out how much that should be, but it's always a little unpredictable, and that's why there's always a little bit of, you know, less than absolutely precise, perfect fit for most models. Because Bandai doesn't do that process, they have great fit. Um, so that, that process hardens plastic against harsh thinners. And that's why Bandai plastic has what's called the Bandai bug, meaning if you're applying thinners, let's say a wash to the model, if it gets on this outer surface here and you run a, a panel line thinner along here and you let it dry and then you wipe it off, everything's fine. There's no problem. Um, it doesn't just eat through the plastic when it's just exposed like this, but when it gets down into Let's say you put some wash on here and it gets into the moving parts 
of the knee joint, for example, and it pulls up in there so that it can't get out, it can't evaporate, fairly quickly the pressure of that and the concentration of that will cause the plastic to break. Now it can be glued back together, but it's, it's a serious problem. I've had it happen to me a time or two when I wasn't real careful about what I was doing. So I say all that to say the more you prime, the less problems you may have if you're going to be using enamel-based or oil-based washes um, because the parts are protected better against that. Now, it's still hard to get down inside the joints and things like that. So when it gets to, to that stage, I'll mention this again and go over some steps that you can do to prevent it. But priming very well helps, um, helps prevent that problem and helps um, uh, address what could be an issue potentially down the road. All right, it's time to get to the dry brushing. For this, I'm going to be using Citadel's Lead Belcher. There are plenty of, you can use any color you want, of course, um, it's your model, but I really like the way Lead Belcher works. Um, it's just a really good steely color. I especially like how it looks when dry brushed over black. Um, because what I'm going for here, Typically, when you think about dry brushing, you're thinking more in terms of edge highlighting. Um, this is, in, in my mind, in my brain of brains, um, what I'm actually doing here, I think of as wet brushing. I want a little more coverage. I still want um, some of the black to show through, but I want a little more coverage. I want it to look a little more steely, a little more grimy. So I'm going to go a little heavier than you normally would with typical dry brushing. Now, I'm going to use, normally I use a big makeup brush, but for this, I'm going to use this beat up um, wide flat brush because it just applies the paint a little heavier. Um, you can tell it's pretty well beat up and used, but that's okay. For dry brushing, it's perfect. Um, so let me get everything prepared and I'll show you how I do that and, and what I mean by what I call wet brushing. Okay, normally I would put some paint in the palette um, so that I could close the lid up and the paint wouldn't dry out, but there's only a little bit left in the bottom, but for my purposes that's fine today. Um, so, but all I do when I'm dry brushing, and you've, I, you know, I'll, I'll demonstrate it because there may be somebody who's watching this who doesn't know what it is, and that's, that's why I do it. Um, but if you've dry brushed before, you know what I'm doing here. Um, I get some paint on the brush, not a lot, and then I wipe off most of it. Now, when you're dry brushing for edge highlighting, you may wipe off more. I'm going to leave a little bit more than I typically would for traditional dry brushing so that I can get a little coverage. Now, I want to do all of the, the brushing in a manner like this. I, I, I want to pay attention to, I guess you'd say, the vectors as I hear Lincoln Wright talk about it a lot. Um, I want it to be essentially up and down. I don't want to go across unless that's the only way to get into an area. But I'm going to start like that. And I'll go in a little light just to see how the paint is going across. But then I'll go in a little heavier just to get more color on here. Again, I want this thing to look not like a black metallic thing with the edges highlighted. I want it to look like a silverish gunmetal metallic thing with some black showing through. So that's the difference um, in my mind when I think in terms of what I call wet brushing is I want the color that I'm putting on to be the majority color, I guess you'd say. Um, and the priming to show through as shadow, to show through as chipping, to show through as wear, um, however you want to sell it um, in terms of, you know, what, what it means visually to the overall model. So you'll see I'm not being, I'm not being real light about it. Uh, I'm, I'm going in fairly heavy. And 
The beautiful thing about dry brushing metallics, and especially this lead belcher, I don't have all metallics do this, is I think it just gives it a really cool, really um, steely look that, that is hard to get on a model using any other method. So this is, this is really um, one of my favorite techniques uh, to apply when I want this look. Now, one thing I do when I'm dry brushing, especially when I'm doing it for this uh, wet brushing type approach, is I always wipe my paint off in the same area. And after a while, I can start picking paint up from here rather than going into the pot or into the palette wherever I've got my paint stored. But I'm just going through, and there's gonna be some details that I paint later, like those hoses. I'm gonna paint those, but I'm gonna go ahead and just put a silver base down on them. Um, it'll help give them a metallic undercoat, which um, if I use thin paint over it, um, it'll look pretty nice. If there are some areas that you decide, hey, I want that to be more silver than not, you can go in and you can change angles to make sure you get more full coverage and you end up with just a painted piece. And that's fine. I, th I think putting in some, some variation like that can look kind of good. Um, but I just continue doing that on this flatter surface where there's less texture. Um, it's just got those... You'll see them pop out there. It's very dark, so I don't know if it'll show on camera, but as I dry brush it, you'll start seeing those parts. But I'm just going to go in again and dry brush it. Let me pick up, let me see if I can show this. Pick up a little paint off the paper towel, and that helps stretch the paint. But you see how I can develop the color, slowly building it up. Now here's an area that I may go away from my up and down because I want to get in between here a little bit. I can put that in there, but then when I come back and do this, it kind of realigns the grain, so to speak. Let me get a little more paint on there. And I've, I've noticed that, not, not a lot, but there's, there's more than a few people who think dry brushing is a amateurish technique and you know if that's your if that's your one trick that you've got in terms of weathering um, you know it may indicate that that you're coming along and you know learning new skills and that's one of the simple uh, skills that you can apply right out of the gate when you're learning to to weather a model and so sometimes I see people you know act like it's not a legitimate weathering technique but I've, I've built a lot of models, um, and I like the way it looks. Um, it's actually a, a, a very multifaceted technique in terms of how you apply it, what you apply it with, where you apply it, how intensely you apply it. Um, you can do some crazy things with dry brushing and then applying glazes over it or airbrushing over it or something like that. Uh, so it's it's a very flexible technique and one one that you like to have in your toolkit, I think. So anyway, you see how that looks. It just ends up with a steely, um, worn metal look because remember this is inside of the mobile suit. There's going to be grease, you know, flying everywhere. There's going to be stuff rubbing together. Um, you know, look under your car. It may not look like that, but it's going to be dirty and grimy. So uh, that's how I want it to look. All right, I'm going to continue doing all of the parts. Well, at least <laughs> for the purpose of video. I'm going to do some leg parts so that I can then move on to the next step and demonstrate that. But that's all I'm doing is just a heavy dry brush so that it ends up looking more silver than not and lets that black primer coat show through and I think it gives it a really really cool look. Alright I've got the pieces that I was working on dry brushed and uh, it looks kind of steely <laughs> which is exactly what I want to uh, go for inside of uh, the armor pieces. Now again I, I want to reiterate 
most of this won't be seen. I'm doing this purely for fun, but I think there's some value in this. Like, for example, this piece goes approximately there. Um, when the model is built, this is going to go, this part's going to go over it. And then there's going to be a part here. You, you, unless you pull that armor off, um, you won't see this part. Now, I may leave it loose so that the eventual buyer can, can uh, pull it off and take a look at it if they want. But, you know, this detail right here, that's going to have that over it. It's, it's you know, it's never going to see the light of day. But I get back to, you know, why I build models. I mean, yeah, I build models for content, and, I of course, I earn some revenue on it. Um, supplements our income, there's all of those things, but ultimately I do it for fun. And painting this kind of stuff, that's the fun part. So, you know, if you decide on a particular model, hey, it's not going to be seen, I want to worry about the exterior, I'm going to move on beyond that, that's fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm not going to get mad at you if you tell me you do that. But I'm looking at this going, that's just too much fun to pass up. Uh, that's 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 making what I paid for the model, which wasn't a whole lot, but that makes what I paid for the model well worth it. I get I get to squeeze out plenty of hours of uh, of enjoyment from it and some content. <laughs> so that's that's uh, that's why I'm doing this. So anyway, now that it's dry brushed, now that it's got the color on it, I want to darken down some of the shadows. I want to extend that steely, grimy look. Um, even further. And as much as I like putting lead belcher over a black uh, priming color, I like putting Citadel's Non Oil over lead belcher over a black base. Um, non Oil is an acrylic shade. It, it works in many ways like um, a, a traditional panel line wash but it's not the type of product that you put on and then wipe off the excess. There is a way, and, and later on in a later video, I'll probably show this if I remember, um, but there is a way that you can put it on and then clean up some afterwards. But generally, with this, you're trying to be fairly precise about the application because where it goes is where it stays, and you can get some staining and other things that if you're not wanting them, will not look optimum. Now, working with Bandai plastic, because this is water-based, it's not going to be. It's not going to present any. I've never had any problems with using Citadel's um, shades, and because I want a streaked, grimy, dirty, oily kind of look, the 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 the, the characteristics of this product are perfect for it. Um, so. So that's, that's why I like using this. And another thing to keep in mind, they've got a whole range of colors, purples and reds and greens and blues, and they have all these crazy names for them, but they're just, they're just colors of, of shade. You can put that over these metallic parts. I could give this a blue tint or a red tint or a green tint um, using any of those shades. So there's a lot of tonal possibilities that you can um, take advantage of with these. So don't overlook uh, these products. And, and a final point about them, I uh, sound like I'm a, you know, selling them for GW. Um, a final point is they dry really fast. So unlike oils and enamels, which I could use over this to bring out the recesses, um, those would take anywhere from overnight to depending on how heavy I put them on and what I used, as much as a week to dry. This stuff will be dry in half an hour and I can start putting more stuff over it. Uh, so it's, it's a really flexible, really good product uh, to use in your, in your modeling. When you're using Non Oil, you want to give it a really, really, really good shake. Um, if it's not mixed well, it comes out glossy. This is the matte version of it. They have a gloss version, which has its own purposes and uses, and um, I like using that. But for this one, I want to end up with a matte finish, and I don't want to have to um, apply a matte coat. So I'm just going to go with 
uh, the matte version. And I take it straight out of the paint pot. Um, I'm going to be applying a lot of it here. I'm going to be using this just large brush here. Um, it's, it's just a synthetic brush. It's seen a lot of a lot better days. And all I'm going to do is get some. I generally take it out of the lid, but you can go right down into the pot if you want. And I'm just going to slop that on. I'm not going to be... Um, gentle with it. I'm not going to try and, you know, only use a little. I'm going to give it a heavy coat. Now, I do want to spread it around some because while I don't mind it pooling up, it, you know, to, to look as though it's oil staining or something like that, I want to avoid obvious tide marks um, if I can, meaning where they don't look organic to the model, you know, so that if somebody looks at it, their brain doesn't tell them big chunk of steel. Their brain tells them little tiny plastic toy. Uh, but I'll just go around and apply that this shade, and you can you can let it dry. Um, by the time I get done with just these parts here that I have on the table on my workbench, I can let that dry. Um, or, or I can let them dry while I'm working on others. And by the time I get done with all of them, this first piece will be dry. And if I want to, I can go in and add in additional, um, sorry if that was off camera, add in additional shade to really sell the, the shadows and the steely look. You see how it's kind of pooling right down here like that? That's the kind of thing I want. I want there to be some heavy shadow in some of the areas. So I'm okay if it pulls right there. I'll even try and see if it'll, well, it won't stand up, but I just go through and continue this. On these flatter pieces, um, I'll flip it over because I want more of the shadow along the bottom. So by flipping it over, as I'm holding it, it'll it'll collect on those surfaces like that. The ridges, because they're up, will hold more of the shade and the parts that I want to be lighter, it'll, it'll you know, there'll be a little bit of flow down the piece. And again, I'm probably being a little over zealous with this because, you know, if somebody does pick it up and look up his bell bottoms, they're going to essentially see some dark, some dark plastic recesses um, and they'll get an indication that it's dirty and grimy and they won't see all of this, but that's okay. I think it's, I think it's really fun to do. And again, that's why I'm, that's why I'm doing it. So I'll continue with all of these pieces here and, uh, and show you what that looks like. And I think it'll be about time to wrap up the video. All right, I have the shade applied to, to these parts. Um, and you'll note that it really tones down that, that uh, lead belcher color. So it's got a really grimy, steely look. Um, very very dirty very brushed metal used metal kind of thing now there's there's several notes i need to i need to make here um, just so you can get the most out of these products i think one you could go back and do a much lighter dry brushing with either lead belcher or even a brighter silver and especially if you did it just from above um, making the strokes just down strokes only you would pick up the higher edges and a brighter silver would make those uh, shine a lot more. Um, so you would have some real edge highlighting in there. That can brighten up the edges if that's the look you're going for. Um, it can be um, a really cool look. I'm not doing it here because, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to have as much fun as I can, but the, the fun for the next steps, and this will actually be in the next video, will be painting all of these little details different colors. Um, so I'm going to focus on that rather than additional dry brushing uh, to bring out those edges. Now, on parts that are going to be more visible, I may do that. 
um, just so that they'll they'll show up a little better. Another thing to keep in mind is if you want to go back later, because putting on that wash in the real heavy fashion that I did across the whole thing, that did some shading, um, uh, some, some panel lining, I guess you'd say, but it also works kind of like a filter over everything. So it kind of blends everything together. It kind of filters everything. If you want additional shadow and recess, you can go back in with a fine liner brush and get just around the edges to even to deepen those even more. Um, if you're wanting less of a dramatic appearance, you can thin this with water or with Citadel makes um, this medium. It's called Lamian Medium, but basically it's colorless paint. It's the it's the stuff that that is the you know the 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 binder of their paint, the liquid of their paint. So you can thin it with that. You could thin it with water, but if you thin it with that, it's not going to break up the paint. It's going to retain the acrylic properties. And you could also use something like glaze medium from Vallejo. I've done that. Uh, so there's a lot of other products you can use with it. You can add additional color to the non-oil shade or to any of them by either mixing shades together or just by putting in a drop or two of, of acrylic paint. Um, like for instance, if you want some really deep shadows, um, put some of the known oil in your palette, get a good amount of there, and just put in a drop of black acrylic paint and, and stir that up, get that thinned in there. When you put that in there, it's going to give you some deep, dark shadow. Um, so there, there's a, a lot you can do with that, with, that, uh, with that product, so I highly recommend it. And uh, I think this is going to be a great basis uh, for the internal frame parts of this Gelgoog. Okay, well I hope this has given you some, some interesting uh, ideas for you, the way you may want to do uh, frames on your Gunpla. Obviously there's a, 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 lot, uh, a lot to go, there's a lot more to do. I plan to do um, a lot of detail painting in this and maybe some edge highlighting in areas that will be seen. So uh, the next series in this, the next video in this series will include uh, that and, uh, you know, the detail painting and, and some thoughts on that. So uh, be sure and subscribe. There should be a little button down there somewhere. Uh, be sure and subscribe and click the little bell icon when you know, so you'll know when things come out. Um, I do a video at least every Friday. Uh, sometimes I'll be able to get one out on Tuesday. This type of video I think of in my head as my feature videos, so the Gelgoog is always going to be a Friday video. It's not going to be every Friday for the Gelgoog because I've got some other series that I'm rolling along to, but look for uh, the next video in this series in two or three weeks from the time that, that this is launched, whatever day this is launched on, uh, and that's how I just continue to kind of roll things along. But it's a, it's a fabulous kit. I'm having fun with it now. Um, I'm looking forward to the fun that I'm going to have with it in the next episode, in the next steps that I take. And then when it all gets together and I start doing the externals, I think it's going to be even more fun. Gunpla is, for me, um, it's, it's where I find my fun now. I used to build aircraft, and at the time I loved it. I don't regret doing it. I had a lot of fun with that. But... This is the fun stuff for me. If you've not tried one of these, I would highly recommend getting one, giving it a try, and uh, just kind of enjoying the process. That's, that's what this is about, enjoying the process. I always say, in our hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong, and I think that really applies. So anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. If you're still watching now, you were a superstar. Thank you so much. Um, I do appreciate it. Uh, like I said, please subscribe. Uh, there are links down below for my blog, for the various social media that I'm on. And of course, uh, I do have a Patreon account. It's, it's a Patreon that allows me to uh, buy paints, buy, buy glue, buy models, uh, get the camera that I need, the microphones, uh, the software that I use to... Uh, to produce the videos, all of those things. I couldn't do this um, if it weren't for the support of patrons. So 
I would be most grateful if you would consider supporting me in my work. There's links below. You can see the various rewards, the various levels. So please do consider that. If you're already a patron, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful. My family and I are so grateful that you choose to support us every month, uh, support me in the hobby, and support them by me not having to try and use our household money, uh, which is very tight, to try and do this kind of thing. So uh, we're very grateful for it because it works out on so many levels. And uh, with all that being said, happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.